good morning. I think we'll get started with our grand round. We have two speakers this morning. The first will be Dr. Kelsey Duster Switlick uh, from our neurology department. She'll be presenting about optic nerve drusen. And then the second presenter will be Dr. Zog, uh, who will present about intracameral antibiotics for endophthalmitis prophylaxis. Thanks. Hey guys, I want to thank you for having me and thank you for a great month here at the Moran. Uh, my presentation is on the optic um, nerve head drusen, um, something that came up a lot actually during my month here at the Moran. So I have um, two cases very different to present. Um, the first case is a 15 year old female. Um, she came for the evaluation of transient blurry vision. It involved both eyes, lasted seconds, occurred about once a week. Um, didn't seem to have any triggers or diurnal variation. And um, she was evaluated initially by an outside ophthalmologist who noted inflammation of the left optic nerve and hence the referral to neuro-ophthalmology. She had a CT head and that was read as normal, no signs of int increased intracranial pressure. Um, she does have a history of headaches. They sen sound more vertiginous in nature. Um, and then she had some nonspecific neurologic symptoms, including lightheadedness and anxiety. Her history was um, notable for seizures. She had a febrile seizure when she was a kid, and again when she was 12 years old after watching actually a gross movie in, in school. Um, she had some mild headaches, no ocular history that we could ascertain, um, past medical history. She had recently diagnosed hypothyroidism um, and just started treatment for that depression as well. Um, she had syndactyly requiring orthopedic surgery in the past. Um, she was obese. Family history, no one had any ocular history. Her mother did have multiple sclerosis as well as migraines. Um, she's in the ninth grade, having in trouble in school because of her anxiety. So her ex eye exam um, was um, notable for, excuse me, Um, <laughs> I'll make this quick. Um, it was notable for normal visual acuity. She had normal pressure. She did have an APD um, in the left eye, but not in the right eye. Her visual fields were full. Her eyes were um, orthotropic. And on her Humphrey, Humphrey visual field, on the right it was normal. On the left she did have a um, superior arcuate defect. And um, if I was really good, this is what I would see on her fundoscopic exam. So we can see the right looks pretty unremarkable. On the left, there is um, a raised optic nerve, 360 degrees. Um, and I don't know if anybody can see anything else. There was the question of maybe some optic nerve drusen in the left. Pretty unclear from, from these pictures. Um, if we look at spectralis, they really jump out at you, though. So here you see um, inferiorly on the left optic nerve drusen um, showing up as a hyperacute fluorescence. And her CT head here, um, which is red as normal. I don't know if anybody can find anything abnormal. Um, we're looking at the left eye. It's really hard to make out. But on review, we thought that there is a little hyperdensity right there in the posterior globe of the left eye. And that would correspond nicely with a buried um, druse. So this was a really nice example. It's not too exciting. It's something I'm sure you've all seen before, but pretty classic. Um, and so a good um, exemplary case um, of optic nerve head drusen. It's an autosomal dominant trait. About 1% of the population has it um, if you actually look for it. And the prevalence increases significantly if you have a family history, about 10 times. It's more common in Caucasians. Um, and they do note that um, it's rare in African Americans because they tend to have a wider scleral canal, um, which is interesting. The cause um, is sort of unclear. We know it's predisposed by a um, scleral canal and optic disc that's large, smaller than average. And this causes some stasis in the axoplasmic flow and abnormal axonal metabolism, allowing for a calcium-like globular deposit in the papilla. The natural history, 
often early on they're buried and they can be uncalcified um, and not clinically significant as you age. So in the second and third decades, they can be become more um, visible at the, uh, at the um, disc surface. And symptoms, generally asymptomatic, um, you can have visual field defects. Most commonly, um, you'll have an enlarged blind spot or you'll have an um, arcuate defect or scotoma. Um, rarely, people will note decreased visual acuity. Um, visual field defects are much more common if the optic nerve drusen is visible at the surface. If they're buried, you only have about a third um, percent chance of having visual field defects. And um, interestingly, there is an association with um, retinal hemorrhages, and a lot of times this is thought to be due to the interference of the nerve's blood supply. This can happen in 2 to 10 percent of the population. So identifying optic nerve head drusen on their own, they're not um, very concerning, but they can lead to um, misdiagnosis and mistreatment. So we, ha we had a few cases that received lumbar puncture that were on Dimax, which they did not tolerate, whose moms were scared they had a mass lesion in their brain. Um, so they can cause some morbidity if they're misdiagnosed and lead to unnecessary <coughs> testing. Until recently, um, we relied um, on direct vis visualization, and in the um, 90s and early 2000s, um, B-scan ultrasonography was thought to be one of the best modalities to pick these up. Um, CAT scans, as you saw, sometimes can see them, and then the fundus autofluorescence as well. So our second case is a two-year-old boy. Um, he was referred from an optometrist after the optometrist noted that he had bilateral disc swelling on exam about a year ago, and he was evaluated initially, not because he had symptoms, but because his sister had IIH, and his mom wanted him to be evaluated for that as well. Um, he was started on Diamox 500 a day um, when he was diagnosed with the bilateral disc swelling. Didn't notice any improvement, um, especially because he didn't have any symptoms. Um, so he denies any of the classic symptoms of IIH, had no dim outs, pulsatile whooshing, diplopia, um, postural headaches, no risk factors, um, no weight change or new medications. They did not LP him. He has not had a recent MRI. Um, his only ocular history, he is colorblind. Um, and his past neurologic history is this interesting diagnosis of a pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, with sensory processing disorder as an infant. He's worked up at Primary Children's. Mom thinks he's now meeting milestones. He just requires some extra tutoring. Um, his sister, who's now 14, was diagnosed with IH when she was nine. Mom has, quote unquote, poor vision. And on his exam, um, his um, visual fields were, visual function was normal except for color vision. He did have um, comitant right esotropia. His anterior chamber exam was normal. And um, on fundoscopic exam, um, he could see what I would describe as funny looking optic nerves. So very anomalous. Um, he has um, normal, normal vessels around the outside, but definitely raised, especially superior, and um, basically no cup to disc ratio. Um, his mother had um, small cupless optic nerves as well. She did have venous pulsations present and she did not have drusen. So this is his spectralis um, scans, and we do not see any drusen um, in comparison to our previous case, just the anomalous looking um, optic nerves. And then we uh, went on to get more information because we couldn't quite tell why this guy's um, optic nerves looked so funny, um, whether it was just his nerves or there's something else going on. So we did um, get an OCT of the nerve retinal fiber layer, and it just showed some, um, some um, superior um <coughs> fullness on both sides. Um, we only did a Humphrey of his left. He had had a Humphrey visual field of his right, um, and he really wasn't very good at doing his Humphreys. So the one on the left really didn't show anything notable. Um, and then we went on to get enhanced depth imaging OCT. Um, we see here that he had um, very full optic nerves on both sides. Um, and then there's possible um, buried drusen. Um, 
Notably, there's a hyporeflective kind of foci here, surrounded by some hyperreflective foci. A little bit unclear, but we thought that there was bilateral optic nerve um, drusen. And there's some scatter, which you can see with those as well. So um, OCT was first used on the human eye in 1991. It's been in clinical practice since um, early 2000s. Um, and it's really revolutionized the way we look for certain pathology. Um, it has a very high resolution, so um, four to five microns. Um, and it allows cross-sectional imaging. Um, so Randy Cardon, who um, studies this a lot, presented multiple cases um, and lectures at the last NANOS, um, likens this actually to uh, in vivo biopsy um, because of the high resolution. There's been many studies um, looking at whether um, you can use OCT to compare optic head nerve drusen to optic disc edema, and they're very favorable. So I noted kind of the three main ones. They're all very similar as far as um, how many patients they looked at and their finding. So the first Johnson studied 60 patients um, and found that with 80% sensitivity, 90% specificity, you could use a retinal nerve fiber laver and a subretinal hyporeflective space thickness to differentiate these two entities. Um, Lee likewise found that the retinal nerve layer, fiber layer was very helpful, especially the nasal section, um, which was significantly thic thicker in the disc edema. And they gave some standardized um, levels. Um, and then the last one, Sarek, um, looked at three, looked at 75 patients and um, pretty much had the same findings, all statistically significant. So what are we looking at here um, when we talk about the enhanced depth or the, with the OCT? Um, on the left, we see um, at the top just a nerve, normal optic nerve. And then um, middle and bottom left, this is mild um, and this is um, pretty marked um, elevation due to optic nerve drusen. And then on the right in comparison is disc edema. And when you compare the two, you notice that drusen tends to have what they call a lumpy bumpy pattern. Um, and over here with the disc edema, it's more, they call it kind of the lazy V pattern here. So um, enhanced depth imaging is something we started using um, recently, and it's just a recent modification to this standard spectral domain OCT. Um, the first study which really um, showed um, the importance of this was um, Sato in 2013, um, and this was retrospective, and they basically showed that um, this EDI allows a complete depth of the prelaminar optic nerve, thereby showing the optic nerve head drusen in its entirety. Before that, you can just kind of glimpse the top part if they're deeply buried, they're hard to appreciate. Um, additionally, noted an inverse correlation between the size of the drusen and the, nerve, um, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And then a prospective cross-sectional study was done the same year um, showing that the EDI has a statistically significant detection, increased detection rate um, compared to B-scan ultrasound. Um, so 52 versus 40 of the 68 patients um, that they were looking at. Um, and the interesting thing here is they divided these cases into definite, um, suspected, and then normal optic discs. And um, enhanced depth imaging compared to just the normal spectral domain imaging, did not have a statistical um, significant difference um, when they were definite cases, but it was very helpful when they were just suspected. The EDI did have um, definitely improved, um, improved findings. So um, kind of in a nutshell, the benefits of the enhanced depth imaging it shows the deep borders that are often missed by conventional OCT. And um, it, it allows us to assess the shape, structure, and topographic location of the drusen within an optic disc. So here um, in the middle, we have just the, the um, standard OCT. 
And in the bottom, we have the EDI OCT. And I don't know if it comes up well, but um, both of them have this hyporeflective area. But here you can see the kind of inferior margins more clearly. You can see um, hyperreflectivity um, more clearly. Um, so you can imagine if there was a smaller druse very deeply, it might not show up kind of in this gray zone here, but would here. There's a little more contrast. So with our, two pa with our last patient, we know he has um, anomalous looking nerves. We think he might have drusen. Is this explaining um, his presentation? Or are we missing something? And we always worry that we could be missing something that could harm him, such as papilledema. Again, he hasn't had an MRI or a lumbar puncture yet. Um, so can we really rule out papilledema at this point, um, even given our new um, imaging techniques of EDI OCT? So um, there are many people who do think that um, EDI OCT can be very helpful in identifying papilledema. Um, and this is um, from a talk Randy Carden gave. He's from the University of Iowa. And he, he covered this topic extensively at the last Manos meeting. Um, but he finds that OCT can help quantify papilledema severity objectively based on the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and the disc volume. So this is in comparison to the subjectivity of um, just directly looking at the, the discs. Um, and um, he notes that there tends to be, in the past we have our grading system, um, but a lot of intra um, um, observer variability in the grading. And this chart here nicely illustrates a strong correlation between um, the um, retinal um, nerve layer and um, the grade, the Friesen grade um, of the papilledema. So um, additionally, when you look at the enhanced depth imaging OCT, um, Dr. Cardin um, asserts that there's a deformation of Bruch's membrane, which can allow you to determine the pressure differential between the kind of retrobulbar <coughs> compartment and the vitreous cavity. Um, so a very positive angle towards the vitreous indicates increased intracranial pressure. Um, these are two pictures, um, EDI, OCT, of the same patient um, with intracre increased intracranial pressure. And you notice on the top, Bruch's membrane here is angulated sharply up. So you can imagine pressure kind of pushing out. Um, when this was treated with high volume tap, Bruch's membrane has normalized. It's almost flat, actually almost a negative angle there. So that's the, the treated scan. If we look at our patient again, um, so this is from that second patient, we notice here that Bruch's membrane does appear normal. So it doesn't look like it's out pouching um, away from the optic um, or from the globe. And um, I recently found out that Druze is actually a German word for geode because of its glittering appearance. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Warner and Dr. Katz and Dr. Crum and Dr. Kennard for um, putting up with all my questions and helping me this very um, interesting and challenging month. And if you have any easy questions for me, I'll be happy to take those. <laughs> if not, I, I know someone I can talk to. <laughs> and then here are my resources. Sorry about the formatting. I fixed it last, yes, last night and it didn't so stick. Question. Yeah. <coughs>
still kind of learning to stay with it. I, I think every eighth of the tenth for me was better with me being in my right chair. Where I did the rest of the time, I can kind of pick it up. And so I have to pick it up. So I think the skill set of holding it out. I think it is kind of downward trend now. I think a lot of tricks we do, we can look for beauty in the way people want it. Sometimes people don't want it. Or I kind of learned over the years that I probably had a higher pickup rate than I had in the past. It's, it's fast and it's easy to pick them up. And also, I use the eighth pin a lot with the beauty. Right.